Um, this is going to be a continuation of a study I did back in July called Rebuilding Your Walls. And in July, I spent so much time getting into the history of Nehemiah's uh, life and mission, I didn't get to the point. So <laughs> we're going to do a quick review and then get to uh, how Nehemiah got this job accomplished that God called him to. Okay, in review, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, Moses is told, you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all of your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. During Solomon's reign, the temple was built in Jerusalem, and Israel rose to the height of its glory, and Jerusalem's fame basically caused every nation to acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. However, the unfaithfulness of the Jewish people led to the eventual destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. In fact, the destruction was so thorough, Nebuchadnezzar spent two full years with his entire army thrashing Jerusalem until he basically burned it to the ground. All of that is in 2 Kings chapter 25, and it's it's quite devastating to read about it. It stayed in that destroyed condition for 150 years. God's chosen city, ruined by the sin of his chosen people. Nehemiah was called by God in 444 BC to go to Jerusalem after Hanani had returned from there to Shushan on a recon mission with this report in Nehemiah chapter 1. In fact, let me just take a moment. We're going to cover a bunch of scriptures in the book of Nehemiah, so if you'd like to turn there this morning, we'll start in chapter 1 and move through a bunch of chapters here. Nehemiah 1 verse 2, Han and I, one of my brethren, came with me, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So God here spoke to Nehemiah, commissioned him to act on this sad situation that had happened to Jerusalem. Nehemiah was Artaxerxes' cupbearer, and he asked the king and received permission to journey to Jerusalem with an entire entourage all the way across the desert from basically Iraq through Jordan to Israel in modern day terms. He answered the call of God to go and to rebuild and restore the walls in the city of Jerusalem and the people of God back to where God can once again be glorified. I personally believe that God surrounds us and protects us with spiritual walls when we establish a relationship with him. Psalm 139.5 says, You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Yet it's possible to tear down the walls that God has built up and protected us with by our own sinful actions, by our thoughts, or by our circumstances, mostly by our refusal to repent. So my observation is that each of us can very quickly fall into traps and become a, a city without walls to become broken and vulnerable to every kind of spiritual attack. We discussed last time the three different traps. The first trap that we're prone to fall into as believers is self-condemnation. Ephesians 2.8, most of us know this verse, claims that we are sinners saved by grace through faith. Yet we hold ourselves to a standard of behavior that we think we're falling short of achieving. And that drives us to a state of self-condemnation. If you've experienced self-condemnation, you know what it's like. I came out of a very religious church and the theme that I grew up with is God hates me and has a terrible plan for my life. And I could never do enough stuff. And I think I've related this story before. When I was about 11, I actually stole money out of the collection basket. And on the way home, I stopped at 7-Eleven and bought some now and laters. 
That was the worst candy I ever had. But the thing that happened to me is I realized that day that I had done so many bad things up to that point, there was no way I was going to do enough good stuff to make up for it. So I was below purgatory. I was done. Self-condemnation. And it drove me away from the church. I went because I had to, but I didn't have a relationship with a loving God at all. He was a wrathful God of judgment, and I was going to get whipped. And that's just how it was. Healthy Christian believers can experience the same thing because you dream up scenarios in your head that aren't realistic. And if you practice self-condemnation enough, it becomes your reality, and pretty soon the God that loved you, that called you to him, is a million miles away. The second trap that can afflict believers is your circumstances. And realistically, all of us are either entering into circumstances or enduring them now, or just getting out of situations that are tough. It's just the human condition. We live in a fallen world, and that's the life cycle that we live in. Nobody has it good 100% of the time. In fact, I don't know how you were affected by it, but when I kind of dove into all the information about Steve Jobs from Apple, and you know the, the biography that was written about him, the TV specials, I'm intrigued by people that are that aware, that can come up with products that we all want to use, that we all aspire to, that's that smart. And you know that Apple is the healthiest business that has ever existed on the planet Earth. They're worth billions and billions of dollars. And this guy had everything. And the end of his life was a neglect of the cancer that he had that led him to a cancer that was incurable. And it had been at one point, but he refused to do it. So even when you're surrounded by everything you can material, materially possess, it doesn't mean anything. We're still in a, in a life cycle of a fallen world. So our circumstances can consume us. They can tear us down. They can rip your confidence away and erode your sense of protection that God has established you with. Psalm 143.3 reads like this. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. Any of you that have suffered severe circumstances, you can bear witness to that. You know what that feels like of being overwhelmed. And you can feel the walls in your life start to crumble. The third trap is self-exaltation. It's the opposite truth of what I spoke about in the first trap. It's where we develop a standard of behavior and think that we're exceeding it. Like we're way exceeding it. In fact, you can get so filled with self-righteousness that you become one of those people. You know how the world says the problem with the church is all those people, all those hypocrites? We're lumped in with those folks if we let self-righteousness become a standard of behavior that we think we're exceeding. It's a trap that God's people went through, got caught up in, and it led to the most glorious city in history getting demolished by a king that relentlessly broke it into pieces. God took away what the Jews had, even as the man who buried the talent in Matthew 25. If you remember that story, three men were given talents by a rich guy. The third one was given one talent, and he went and buried it because he was afraid, because his master was a harsh guy. So he buried it, brought it back out, and Jesus said that the response of that rich man when he came to get his his earnings was to tell him, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. The Jews had everything, and they buried it in their behavior. And this is what happened to Jerusalem. It was taken from them. We are called to be a temple that God promises to dwell in so that the attention of the world through us is on him. But because of self-inflicted condemnation, because of letting our circumstances overly affect us, or because of self-righteousness, the walls of our lives 
start to crumble and the presence of God flees us. Maybe you're experiencing that this morning. Maybe you've tried to get it right with the Lord and it just isn't happening. What I want to do this morning is look at Nehemiah's examples of overcoming pretty tough adversity to accomplish a work that God gave him to do to restore Jerusalem to where it should have been. We're going to talk this morning about rebuilding the walls in a personal application. Now, I read a book recently called No Easy Day by Mark Owen, and if any of you have heard about it, it's a book that details in minute detail the um, demise of Osama bin Laden. And it's written in a, in a kind of a prose. If any of you saw Avatar, at the beginning of the movie, the military guy that is paralyzed, he's narrating it, kind of like a documentary. And he has this real kind of monotone, kind of military uh, tempo in his voice. And when I read this book, that voice carried me through this whole thing. It was very military, very uh, by the book, uh, very detailed. In fact, when I heard that the Pentagon was taking Mark Owen to task, and he's, he's facing some legal action right now, that's when I bought the book, because I thought, man, if the Pentagon's after this guy, it's the real deal. And nobody has refuted anything he said in the story. Now, one of the things that I was really intrigued by is the amount of weaponry that these Navy SEAL guys carry with them. And it's a lot of weight, but the thing about it is how everything in his assault kit, which is what he called it, had a specific purpose. If you look at this picture, this is a shot of Mark Owen's assault kit that he traveled with. So these guys are stationed in, in Virginia for the most part, in different parts of the country, but this is their stuff. So they've got weapons, grenade launchers, knives, they've got uh, smoke, they've got at the bottom there's a big ballistic set of plates they wear on their upper body that's completely almost armor proof and everything that he has is a specific item for a specific reason and he goes into detail in one chapter and talks about where he puts every piece of equipment and why. There's something in this pocket that he needs here. His weapon for this is over here. Uh, they got this thing called a pirate gun that looks like, a, like an old pirate's weapon that's a grenade launcher. And when you get, you know, he's building up toward what's going to happen at the compound in Pakistan, but he talks about how everything is in the exact position. And these guys are precise. But this perfectionism that these guys have to operate by just to keep their lives as safe as they possibly can was amazing to me. He had weapons at his disposal in this assault kit that I think is so similar to the spiritual weaponry that God has told us about in the book of Ephesians. One of the things that, uh, that Mark Owen talked about was the new set of night vision goggles. They're called NVGs. And this is what night vision goggles look like now. They used to have two optics coming out the front. Now there are four, and these soldiers have almost 180 degrees of peripheral vision at night where no one can see them, no moon, no nothing, and they have full view of everything. And he talked about how important that field of vision was, especially during the raid on the compound in Pakistan. So back to Nehemiah. When he arrived at the city of Jerusalem with his entourage, he was already under suspicion from the governor of the region, Sanballat. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 2 with me in verse 9, the scripture says, Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When we're talking about Artaxerxes here, sending this uh, detail with Nehemiah. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah his advisor, the Ammonite official, heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. So we see here, even before Nehemiah gets started, he's in spiritual warfare. He's entering right into it, and he doesn't even know that this is happening yet. But we see here almost a behind-the-curtain look at how Satan operates in our lives. As soon as you start doing the right thing, as soon as you step out of disobedience into obedience, Satan is distressed. Whether you're doing a work to rebuild your own life 
or doing something in service to serve someone else, he's already distressed and making plans. One of the things that I realized reading this is that Christians especially need to realize that when you wake up in the morning, you're in spiritual warfare. It starts right now. And if any of you have staggered into the kitchen and started making coffee and broke your cup or knocked it over on the counter and have to start all over again, spiritual warfare. It's all around us. And knowing it ahead of time, the way that we can see it here in the book of Nehemiah is really helpful. In fact, it's our night vision goggles. To know ahead of time the enemy's out there, we can see him through the scriptures, scheming, and be able to prepare and plan for it. Let's look at our weapons we have in Ephesians chapter 6. This is our assault kit. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It is so much easier for the enemy to get his attack going before we know we're even in it, especially when you're at a place of vulnerability, when you're broken and you're ready to get back on track. It seems like that's when the fires heat up. But with the knowledge that our very first steps of obedience are going to be met with a fight, we have the advantage. We can see it coming. So we can see in three-dimensional, four-optic night vision and not be stopped before we start. So point one is to remember that we're in a spiritual battle. My second point is enduring ridicule. Now, Most of us haven't really paid the price as believers and gotten slammed in public, been made fun of. Uh, You may have ventured into the arena of sharing your faith and gotten snuffed a little bit, but nothing like what Nehemiah went through in a monumental cause that he was about to undertake. Look with me in Nehemiah 2.19. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab. Geshem the Arab was a commander of a, basically a pseudo-terrorist group that Sanballat had control of. They were like a militia serving this corrupt governor, doing his bidding. When they heard of this process that Nehemiah was about to undertake, the scripture says they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So just as Nehemiah is getting everybody emotionally attached, these Israelites that had lived in this area in this broken down ghetto all this time, just when they're investing emotionally, we want to do this, we want to get involved with this, the big shot governor comes in and says, what do you guys think you're doing? And I'm sure they were extremely humiliated just at the beginning of this. They laughed at the Jews. They despised them, and they made statements meant to humiliate the Jews into not even getting started. And I think that that's probably the best way to get beat, is get beat before you even get going. Because if we throw the flag in then, we're done. In Nehemiah 4, verses 1 and 2, here's the second situation. When, ne- when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. He spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria, so he brought the whole army together in front of the Jews and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Feeble is a word they used to use then that meant a woman that couldn't bear children. So it was the ultimate insult. Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? And those stones they're talking about were limestone that they had built the original wall out of. And when Nebuchadnezzar torched Jerusalem, all of that limestone actually burns. And when it burns, the stones still look like structural stones, 
but they disintegrate inside. And if you go to do anything with them, they crumble. It's like charcoal in your barbecue pit. There's nothing left. It may look like a structure, but as soon as you touch it, it pulverizes. Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. What I realized in this little story here is that ridicule comes in all shapes and forms, but really it's generated by the enemy of your soul. Ridicule can come from a friend, from a family member, from somebody you've never met before that you're trying to do something kind for or share the gospel with, or it can come from your own thought life. You can ridicule yourself into oblivion. Yet, that's the human condition. And a lot of times we don't fight back because it's easier not to fight back if somebody ridicules you. Yet, look at Nehemiah's response in Nehemiah 2.18. In that first sequence, he says, And I told them of the hand of God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's word that he had spoken to me. So there was no outburst. There was no freak out. There was no screaming. He simply drew the sword of the spirit, God's word, and he stood confidently on the word and on the promise of King Artaxerxes. So in one quick shot, he completely annihilated the ridicule that was aimed at the Jews. The second sequence, look at Nehemiah 4, verse 4 again. There he says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their heads and give them as a plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So here, Nehemiah lays this simple prayer out to the Lord right in front of these guys. And as a result of that prayer, the workers were so encouraged, the scripture says there that they built up almost half the height of the wall all the way around the city after this happened. Because Nehemiah stood his ground and backed that ridicule right back down. You know, I think that Suffering ridicule sometimes is the hardest thing of all. It's easier to get struck sometimes than to get ridiculed. And I remember a couple of years ago, well, probably 10 years ago, I had my tonsils out as an adult, which is not pleasant at all. And as an adult, it's not as fun to eat a whole bunch of ice cream because your body needs a little more than that. As a kid, it's probably a little more fun. But I remember having to take Darvocet which is, it's got some kind of pretty intense narcotic in it, and it didn't bode well with me. So on a stomach of, it must have been lollipops and, you know, whatever, ice cream, I don't know what else I could eat. I was hungry, and I was tired, and my tonsils, well, what used to be there, was killing me, because the inside of your throat is completely shredded, and you've got to survive, and it's trying to heal itself, and it just isn't fun. Well, the Darvis set was pretty cool during the daylight hours, and I was a little dopey, and, you know, you'd watch TV, and every commercial's kind of fun. And <laughs> Then I woke up at 3 o'clock one morning completely freaked out, and I had done a couple Darvis sets before I went to bed because I just didn't want to wake up. But I, I woke up, and I walked into the kitchen, and I just heard this voice saying, you're a loser, you're done. You're not a believer. God hates you. You're a pretender. What a hypocrite. Over and over and over. And then finally, kill yourself. I'm like, whoa. And it made sense. All of it that I was hearing made sense. I mean, the enemy was blasting me. The only thing that I had to fight that ridicule, and having kids, most of you know this little song, all I could think of was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I sang it over and over and over. And literally, it pushed the ridicule into this little place and it disappeared. And I was like, wow, that was such spiritual warfare. Well, I got off the Darvocet. No more of that. But it's, sometimes it's easier to give up. And when you read the crazy stuff that people do, it's easy to poke fun at it. In fact, I think the, 
something I really need to stop doing is reading articles about crazy stuff and then the comments that people write in <laughs> after the articles, because they are so harsh. We don't know what these people are dealing with, but I was on the edge of not doing the ultimate stupid thing, but I was, I was close, just from Darvaset, and I wasn't suffering anything else. So what I think is, if we allow ourselves to suffer with ridicule, it will consume us. And one thing that the Lord had really spoken to me is to never, ever let myself think that I'm suffering more than the next guy. Like, I'm going through it and they have no idea what I'm going through. Because once you start that, it becomes such a pity party, you become self-righteous. If you think you're having to go through this and nobody else understands and nobody gets me, but that's our nature. Here's what the Lord showed me in regard to thinking that I, I am suffering the most or I suffer the most. Psalm 22, verse 6, reads like this. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Well, this was the ultimate attack of ridicule that anybody has ever faced. And we know that as believers, as the Messianic Psalm. This was Jesus on the cross, suffering at the hands of these people. And the result was, his endurance gave us our salvation. So, we have a Savior that's intimately versed in ridicule. He knows what it's like. And we will never suffer to his extent. But we know that we have a friend that's closer than a brother that experienced it and understands it, and he's there for us. So point two, ridicule comes from the enemy, yet the word of God will slice through it and overcome it as quickly as we turn to him. Third point, not everyone's willing to go with the program. When you're in the midst of rebuilding, when you're in the midst of helping someone else, you may get feedback that makes you feel like, how come they're not going through this? How come they're not helping? How, no, how come they're not receptive to my needs? Nehemiah 3 verse 5, there's a little verse here that I've never seen before. And I tell you, the Old Testament, if you can take a backhoe to it and start digging around, stuff comes out of there that, that's mind-blowing. So here's this little verse. I've read this passage 50 times in the last couple of months, and it popped up Friday. Next to them, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything else. I don't know who these nobles are. It just says that they didn't put their shoulders to the work. I think that there's much to contemplate in this verse. We want others to be involved with the work of rebuilding too. And sometimes it doesn't happen. And Jesus was very clear about how to handle this as well. In Luke chapter 10, verse 39, there's a story there that most of us are familiar with. A certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Now, this is a great passage because it's typically human. You know, I think some people think that we believe in, well, here's another source of ridicule. They think Christians believe in their little friend in the sky, their make-believe friend and that the Bible is a bunch of flannel boards, you know, that little kids have to go through because their parents are busy doing something else. Um, this is the real deal. And it's so exactly human what Martha went through. And it's typical. How many times has the enemy used someone else's perceived lack of participation that, to provoke us into a pity party? And that's what Martha was going through. She had her own little pity party going here. And it was destroying the work that Jesus went to their house to accomplish. And Jesus' words of wisdom in verse 41 are just perfect. He said, 
Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken from her. So the rebuilding process can be easily upended by comparing what we're going through with what someone else is maybe not going through. But Jesus set the bar for this. He said, choose that good part. It's so easy and it's so comforting and it's so wise and it's so masculine for him to say something like that to us where anybody can get this. In Nehemiah 3.5, it's obvious that he ignored, Nehemiah ignored that these nobles weren't helping and he went right on with it. So the third point, not everyone is going to be with you, so choose the good part and stay in his presence. Fourth point, when fear and discouragement come against you. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, if you read along with me. Now it happened when Sanballat and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and that the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. And then again, a few verses down, Nehemiah 4.11. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Well, this is pretty scary. You've got an entire army arrayed against these guys, and the word spread through the crowd, they're going to kill us. We need to do something here. Well, Nehemiah wasn't dismayed in the least. His response was really simple. He prayed, and he acted on what God told him to do. Look at Nehemiah 4.9. He says there, nevertheless, in other words, despite this accusation, this fear, this discouragement that surrounded us, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. So he prayed and he acted. And then look at Nehemiah 4.13. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families. Great strategy. You, you defend your family. You may not defend your the guy you don't like down the street, but you'll defend your family. With their swords, their spears, and their bows, and I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, and your houses. This is the coolest thing. Nehemiah realizes that he can just organize them in a different way that completely shut the fear off. There's nothing that they had to be afraid of. And really, it doesn't matter what the enemy's doing if we can say, nevertheless. Another little nugget that I found here. Never, no, nevertheless means no matter what, God is able. Nevertheless, no matter what the circumstances. Philippians 4.6 is probably my favorite passage in scripture. Paul says there to the Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So mysteriously, in this passage in Philippians, Paul shows how God can transmogrify if you like Calvin and Hobbes, anxiety into peace. It's the most amazing thing. Back to Nehemiah. Look at the result now of Nehemiah praying and then acting on what God told him. Nehemiah 4.15, the scripture says, And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. Every single person there 
fearlessly went right back to what they were doing, confidently took back up the tools they were using and got right back to work. When we actually act on the practical things that God instructs us to do, the results are incredible. Now, this is, this is my favorite part of Nehemiah, this next passage. Look at chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, I'm just so happy about this. Nehemiah is a thinking man. He's a spiritual man. He's a praying man. It says there, so it was from that time on, half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. I just think that is the coolest thing. That's how a Christian lives. You do your job and you have the word of God girded to your side. You know, we had a men's retreat a couple years ago, and uh, we had a, a big, beefy, tough, masculine dude carved out of the granite of the state of Maine that came to speak to us, Ken Graves. And if you've ever heard him, he is, it's, it's, you just have to hear him. It makes you uh, proud to be a guy and really proud to be a believer. Uh, he had developed a leather pouch, I guess it was, for his Bible. On the front of it, on the flap, it said, God's word as all one word. So if you read it one way, it read God's sword, or if you read it the other way, it read God's word. And that guy hung that thing on his belt. We've got a brother here that has one, actually, that wears it. And he was so, I don't even know what the word is, proud to wear that on his belt, it really inspired all of us. Um, he had that sword attached to him as he went about his work, and it was a really neat visual for me. I, I have one. I, don't, I didn't wear it today. <laughs> but knowing that, that's, that's, that's how you stay in balance as a believer. You know, you've heard that saying that so-and-so was so spiritually minded they were no earthly good. God called us to be practical workers to be in the world but not of it and that's the balance work at construction you got your sword you're ready to go ready to defend yourself so point four fear and discouragement will come but if you pray with supplication and you're diligent to do what God tells you to do it evaporates and then point five distractions Distractions arise in all of our lives, but especially as you seek to, see, seek to serve the Lord. And how you respond to distractions will either keep you on track or it'll throw you way off base. Three times in chapters 5 and 6 in Nehemiah, he's confronted with distractions that he has to deal with in order to complete the rebuilding of the walls in Jerusalem. Chapter 5 is a sad description of a whole lot of internal fighting where a lot of the families that were working on these walls were being taken advantage of. They were having to sell their property just to have food. Their kids were getting sold into slavery just so they had something to subsist on. And it was all at the hands of the local Jewish opportunists. And I imagine it was the religious leaders that uh, it, they're called the nobles and the rulers, but I think it was the religious leaders that were taking advantage of these people. Nehemiah's response to this massive distraction you can find in chapter 5 verse 6 he said I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words after serious thought I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them each of you is exacting usury from your brother so Nehemiah took this occasion here to directly confront the people who were responsible for distressing the workers and then he used God's law to cause them to repent because Jews were not allowed to charge usury against another Jew. Usury is interest over and above. It's, it's confiscatory. It's like checking the cash. You know, you go there and you need some money up front. The, the interest that you have to pay back to those little places is so crazy. And I noticed something interesting. 
They never have those things in really nice neighborhoods. Like you don't see a check into cash up in Rancho Grande. You don't see it in the country club at San Luis. They're like downtown in places where there's like students and people that don't make a bunch of money. They take advantage of those kinds of people. And it, it really stinks that people charge each other money and destroy families in the doing. But everybody goes to those things voluntarily and that's what these big shots were doing. They were charging excessive interest and driving people into the ground and causing this whole program to blow up. In chapter six, verse two, it shows there that Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem attempted to lure Nehemiah to leave the work and attend meetings outside the gates at a place called Ono. And I just have a feeling the music there isn't very good. But anyway, so he says in verse 2, but they thought to do great harm to me. So I sent messages to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I can't come down to you. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? So this is really cool. Nehemiah uses his God-given spiritual discernment and fends off the false meeting that probably would have been disastrous to him. And you know what? When we're dialed in and we're prayed up, God gives us spiritual discernment. Uh, Jane and I took a, a trip to Yosemite a few years ago, and it was in November, so it was kind of overcasty, dark, but it was really neat to be there. I'd never been to Yosemite. And we, we walked trails, and we rode our bikes, and did all kinds of cool stuff. And in the afternoon, we were going to go up to Bridal Veil Falls, and there was a trail that went off in kind of a wooded area, and we started to head over toward the trailhead, and a guy kind of came in front of us and started walking up the trail. Then he turned back and looked at us, and it was just like that Sasquatch picture. You know, that blurry picture? And it really freaked me out. And we both stopped, and I go, Hun, do you want to do this? And she goes, nah, I don't think so. And I was pretty creeped out. So we ended up just going the other way, but I, I got chills, and it was the weirdest thing. Anyway, we got back home and didn't think too much about it. And the next week was the week that that guy, Carrie Stainer, had lured a girl and her mom and her best friend into that cabin in Yosemite and slaughtered them. And he was an employee at Yosemite. Now, I don't know. I don't know if that was him or not. I just know that when God speaks to me <laughs> in, in accompanying chills, I act on that. Um, he wants to do that for us. It's not magic. He gives us spiritual discernment. And Nehemiah had a real strong sense that that was trouble for him to take off, leave the work, and go down with those people. And he didn't do it. He stayed. Proverbs 16.3 says this, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. How cool is that? He was so committed to the work of God that he didn't have to spend time wondering if he had spiritual discernment. He didn't have to go through any gyrations to gain any special powers. His thoughts were lining up and being established by God because the works that he had committed were dialed into what God had planned for him. And then even after his rebuke to these men, they come at him again, trying to scare him into leaving the walls again to consult with them. In Nehemiah 6.5, it says, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. And Nehemiah's response is pretty interesting. It, it, his response kind of reminds me of someone saying, um, you don't even know that corporations get tax breaks for shipping jobs overseas. Nehemiah's response is, in Chapter 6, verse 8, uh, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. And it completely shut those guys down. So God will even direct your thinking skills as you commit the work to him that he's telling you to do. So point five, distractions will arise, and how you deal with them will either keep you on course or knock you straight off course. Conclusion. God has hedged us in with spiritual walls of protection and strength as we establish a relationship with him. 
Each of us has the potential to have those walls come crumbling down, either from our actions or from circumstances. Yet God has given us specific tools, an assault kit, that helps us to be able to reestablish those walls despite spiritual warfare that we're surrounded with when we seek his face. We're going to encounter ridicule if you're walking with the Lord. You're going to encounter aloneness, fear, discouragement, and distractions that threaten to keep you from moving away from God instead of toward his loving arms. It just happens. But by seeking God in prayer, by seeking him in his word, and committing our works to him, he will establish us and provide for the completing of the work that he's doing in your life and that you're doing in someone else's. Let's pray. Father, we are glad to be called your children. And Father, I thank you that you have knit together a body of believers in this church that you intended to be here to accomplish a work that you're doing in our community and in our families. Lord, you are establishing walls of protection and safety, and you're using us. And Father, we want to commit our works to you, Lord, that you establish our thoughts. And Father, I just want to lift up anyone here this morning that is suffering with self-condemnation, anyone that's going through circumstances that are overwhelming. Or Father, even those of us that think we've got it all together and we don't have any problems. Lord, because I know that that's self-righteousness. Lord, we want to bow the knee to you and submit to your authority this morning. Lord, we want our brothers and sisters spiritually healthy and protected and hedged in on all sides. Lord, I pray you'd use us in the repair of our friends and our families' lives. But mostly, Lord, I know that you want us built up first and foremost. You want that relationship between you and us tight and solid. So, Lord, do that work this morning. And if any of you this morning don't have a right relationship with the Lord, if you don't know the sense of that protection of the walls that he wants to put around you, if you don't know that he loves you and has a place in heaven set up and set apart for you, I'd like you just to pray this prayer with me this morning. Just say to yourself, say to the Lord, God, forgive me. I've sinned and I've caused you to endure ridicule on the cross that paid the price for my sins. I submit the authority of my life to you. I ask that you would forgive me for messing this whole thing up. Lord, that you would forgive me for my sins. Lord, I want to take on your righteousness that you endured to save me. Lord, take over my life. I believe in you. If anyone's prayed that prayer with me this morning, just raise your hand so we can pray for you. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us an Old Testament that is filled with human stories, Lord, that we can relate to Father, I pray that our arsenal of spiritual weapons would be so built up, Lord, that you would put every piece in position right where you want it in our lives, Lord, that we could go before you as, as conquerors and glorify you. In Jesus' name.